schizophrenia. Currently, no collisions reported in London, but you will find a slower drive today for sure, uh, especially slow going east of the city on Dundas or Highway 2 through Thamesford. And then also to kind of make things spicy, at 9 a.m. you'll find new lane restrictions on Gordon Street between Talbot and Richmond Streets. That is so crews can remove some of the old equipment from the Labatt plant, and the work is expected to wrap up by 3 p.m. today. If you have a traffic tip, you can text us, 519-281-6593. All right, thank you, Ryan. There is more snow in the forecast. It should end this afternoon, but before that, we're expecting two to four centimeters, and then this afternoon, cloudy with a 40% chance of flurries or showers. A high of one degree today. Tonight, mainly cloudy with a 30% chance of flurries or showers this evening. A low of minus three tonight. And right now, it's minus one degree with light snow. We're coming up now to 24 minutes past eight. It's time for our check-in with the London Public Library. In this week's It List, it's been four weeks now since the library was hit by a cyber attack. So we're going to get the latest on that situation. And we're going to find out more about this weekend's volunteer fair. So joining us now in studio is Christian Kashgar, the sur supervisor of the Central Library downtown. Christian, it's great to have you. Thank you. Great to be here. All right. So let, let's start with the, the fallout from the cyber <laughs> attack. What kind of services are back up and running now? All right. So as of this morning, we've got Wi-Fi back up at all of our locations, which is wonderful. Um, our public computers and printers are in progress. Um, so if you're thinking about visiting your branch to use the computer or printer, please call your local branch and find out. Um, here at Central, our computers and printing are back up. Um, our so staff's access to our computers, email, and technology is all re is all being restored. So we're all very happy about that. Yeah, I imagine. Um, and email and phone notices about holds are starting to be activated. Um, that'll be a gradual process until the catalog and um, and borrowing are back up to normal. But it's uh, it's definitely a good start. If you get a hold message by email or phone, you can come in and pick up your hold. So oh, that's great. That is really great. That's great news. So progress is being made, but but what's still being sorted? out and not available so what's not available um, my account is not available so that means if you try and go on to check your uh, your items that you have on hold or checked out um, that will not be up to date um, placing holds in the library catalog is not available yet we're working hard we know people are dying to get their holds on um, returns and check-ins are not yet available so we ask that if you have items out please hold on to them a little bit longer as we work to get things back online um, due dates have been extended so no worries about things getting overdue um, and we don't have fines overdue fines anymore and we haven't for, for a few years um, so that's nothing to be concerned about um, the status of books and other items in our catalog is not up to date um, so if you're looking on the, on our website lpl.ca there is a, a catalog page you can access but it won't show you what's exactly on the shelf at that moment. Um, so uh, if you're wondering about something at a location or at Central, give us a call and we can find out uh, if it's here or at a location for you. Um, and on our website, unfortunately, we don't have program and event listings available yet, um, which is, I know, a bummer for a lot of people who want to find out what's happening. Um, but please give us a call and we can try and find out for you. Um, and we're hoping to use our full website soon. Great, and we'll talk about some of those events in just a second. But before we move on from this, how are you guys doing at the library? How's it going over there? How are you feeling? Yeah, we're, we're doing we're doing okay. Um, we're it's nice to have things sort of coming back up. Um, I think a lot you know you don't realize how crippled you're going to be with technology until it happens, and you have absolutely nothing at your disposal to help people. Um, it's nice that all of our locations have remained open, so at least people have been able to come in and browse the shelves. Um, you know, sit and, and have a read or have a visit. Um, so that's been nice that we've been able to see our, our all of our library friends all along. But it's definitely uh, nicer to be able to actually help people and provide them with the things that they're looking for. Okay, that's great. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about some upcoming events. Let's uh, get into this volunteer fair. What's going on there? Volunteer fair. So this is our third volunteer fair. It's coming up January 20th. Uh, from 10 until 2 here at Central in our library commons on the first floor. So it's a great opportunity to come and connect with an organization who's looking for volunteers. Um, it's great. It's a great time for um, organizations who use volunteers to come and show what they're, they have to offer in terms of um, volunteer positions. Uh, there's lots and lots of organizations coming. Um, uh, if anyone's been to our previous ones, you know there's a great turnout of um, would-be volunteers and those looking for volunteers. The library will be there talking about what we have going on for volunteers right now. Um, and yeah, it's a, if, if, it's, if you're looking at a new year, new you kind of resolution, or it's a time of year, I think sometimes where people 
after you know sort of the consumer consumerness of the holidays they're being a bit introspective and want to see how they can give back and give back to their community uh, this is a great time to find out um, wh how you can help and who can help what kind of library or what kind of volunteers is the library looking for um, so we have a, a kind of a variety of volunteer options um, I'm not sure what we're specifically looking for right now but we um, volunteers that help um, support people who have tech needs. So if you get a new computer, if you get a new um, a new phone, and you need help setting it up, we have tech tutors at most of our locations who can help you with that. Um, and those are volunteer positions. We've got volunteers that work with our children's programming to help um, get those all sorted out. Um, we've got volunteers who help us with our mobile performance hall programs, ushers that help um, make sure everyone gets gets to their seats and gets to where they need to be. So lots of opportunities um, at the library um, for volunteers which is great. All right, and then people who are interested in coming to the fair, what, what, what should they do to prepare? Just um, if you have, an, uh, if you have a, an area that you're interested in volunteering in, um, certainly, you know, take some time to have a think about what you might want to do. Um, but if not, just come by. Um, you don't have to commit to volunteering right away. You can just come in, see who's looking for volunteers, get some information, have some chats with people, and, uh, and leave with, with some more information. Do you need a resume or anything? Nope, no resumes. Right. Unless you want to. Okay. Of course, of course. Um, this is great, Kristen. It's, it's always so nice to have you. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Thank you so much. Kristen Cascara, Supervisor at the Central Library. That big volunteer fair is happening at the Central Library on Saturday, January 21st from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Let's take a quick look at the weather. You know what? Saturday is January 20th. I'm going to make sure I get there. It is. Saturday, January 20th from 10 to 2 Let's take a look at the forecast. We've got snow, 2 to 4 centimeters. That's going to change to a 40% chance of flurries or showers uh, later this afternoon. A high of 1 degree today. Tonight, the low of minus 3. So a 30% chance of flurries or showers this evening. A wind chill of minus 7 overnight, so it could be a little bit cool tonight. Right now at the airport, it's minus 1 degree with light snow at 8.30. This is CBC News. From CBC London, the 8.30 local news. Good morning, I'm Angela McKenna. Big changes are coming to Service Ontario. Some centres will be closing and others will be opening in big box stores. CBC Toronto's Ali Chesson has what we know so far and reaction. The Ford government says they're streamlining services by closing down Service Ontario locations and opening up new ones inside Staples Canada stores. The news of the expansion into Staples was actually made in December. We've only just learned this week that it would also mean the closure of some different Service Ontario locations. And it looks like it will be happening sooner later. The Ford government's press release says the change will take place this year, or early 2024 to be exact. Green Party's Mike Schreiner is in Japan, questioning, quote, in what world does it make sense to go to an office of lodging to renew your driver's license or health card? And NDP finance critic Catherine Fife calls it, quote, another attempt for Ford to quietly bring over our public services to private corporations. The Ford government says that employees at these service Ontario locations that will be closing will be able to continue their employment at these new kiosks inside the staple stores. They haven't confirmed which locations will shut down, but say when they do. Another one will open at a nearby staple, so local service is not disrupted. That was the CBC's Ali Shaysan. A CBC investigation has uncovered the e-commerce giant Amazon has sold weapons that are illegal in Canada. That includes switchblades and stun guns. Whistleblowers flag those weapons and more have been available for purchase on Amazon Canada. And as Angelina King reports, some of those items have made it across the border. A knife blade pops in and out at the flick of a switch. Alongside the video of it posted online, a five-star Amazon review saying, somehow this very illegal knife made it to my house and I could not be happier. CBC Toronto discovered the knife and other seemingly illegal weapons after hearing from a former Amazon employee and customer who were both concerned after seeing the products for sale. They've since been removed. The ex-Amazon employee says they noticed a stun gun for sale when they worked for the company in October. 
We aren't identifying them for fear of repercussions to their future employment. They alerted management and it was taken down, but they say it was back online days later. This shouldn't be like playing whack-a-mole. Defense Minister Daniel Goldblum says those who have the weapons could be charged. Same as those selling or importing them. Either for trafficking a prohibited weapon or for importing a prohibited weapon. Amazon says there are controls in place to prevent prohibited products from being sold. And if a seller bypasses them, in the case of the knife, it removes the listing and bans the seller. Angelina McKee, BBC News, Toronto. A London man is facing charges after a North End pharmacy was robbed earlier this week. London police say a man entered a pharmacy near Adelaide and Huron Streets just after 6 o'clock Tuesday evening. He showed an employee a note that said he had a gun and demanded narcotics. The suspect allegedly took cash from a register and police were called. He was located leaving the pharmacy and arrested. No firearm was found and there were no injuries. A 46-year-old man has been charged with robbery with violence or threats in disguise with intent. As London's Green Bay program rolls out next week, their contents will be processed at a site in South London. The Converted Waste Treatment Facility turns organic waste into compost material and water vapor. Located off Highway 401 on Wellington Road South, Convertus also uses compost to make replenished soil. It's sent to farms in Lambton and Middlesex counties. The company's CEO, Mike Leopold, says this is a huge milestone for London. The feedback's been really positive. Um, as you know, people move around. Um, and so in the London area, there is a lot of transplants who come from Kitchener Waterloo or the GTA area, and they're already accustomed to having a Green Bay program, so that we've always gotten calls to say, hey, well, is there a Green Bay program here? How can I how can I participate? So I think there's a, a lot of excitement behind it, and I think uh, we're going to see it really flourish over the next six months. More than 126,000 Green Bins and kitchen containers have been delivered to households. Curbside pickup starts on Monday. You can watch a video tour of the facility on our website. And finally, a historic church in St. Thomas that was key to the city's founding is marking two centuries this year. It was completed in 1824, built over two years on land donated by the founder of St. Thomas. The church is part of the Anglican Church of Canada's Diocese of Huron and is the area's oldest church between Six Nations and Amherstburg. That's according to Steve Peters. He's the vice president of the church's Restoration Trust, an avid local historian, and the St. Thomas City Councilor. It is the place of worship for our first settlers, the place of uh, burial for our first settlers. It, it, it really just is it's symbolic of the beginnings of St. Thomas and, uh, and our past and why we need to preserve them for the future. Peter says $100,000 has gone into restoring Brickburg in the last three years. He says the Restoration Committee will continue to do its part to make sure the church sees a great future. And Andrew, that's your 830 News. Thank you, Andrew. Coming up on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burn, 33 churches have been destroyed by fire across Canada in a little bit more than two years. Front burner host Damon Fairless is going to look at how a pattern of arson is tied to Canada's dark residential school history. So you can listen to Front Burner now anytime on CBC Listen, on YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. And there is snow in the forecast today, two to four centimeters. That should change to a chance of flurries or showers this afternoon. A high of one degree today, a low of minus three tonight. Right now it's minus one with light snow. And you can reach us anytime here at London Morning on our text line, 519-201-6593 or londonmorning at cbc.ca. I'm Andrew Brown. Thanks for listening.
to nut bands across the country. In just a moment, why one school in Whitehorse is now allowing nuts back in class, and whether the evidence suggests a wider rethink on this policy. Also this morning, in 1962, JFK said, we choose to go to the moon not because it is easy, but because it is hard. That difficulty was proven again this week when a lunar lander mission went sideways shortly after takeoff and the mission to send a Canadian in orbit around the moon was delayed. In an hour, our fascination with the moon and why some are worried about the rush to get back there. Plus, the people of Palestine today are being bombed, they are being killed, and we were duty bound to stand up and support the Palestinians. Today, Israel is in the International Court of Justice at The Hague, accused of genocide in Gaza. In 30 minutes, the apartheid legacy that led South Africa to bring this case forward and how Israel is to defend itself. So we begin in the school lunchroom with a previously forbidden sandwich. Good morning, I'm Matt Galloway. This is The Current. It is one thing to make peanut butter sandwiches for your kid. It is another thing altogether, though, to be able to pack those sandwiches up in a lunchbox. Many Canadian schools have banned peanuts because of a number of kids with allergies. But for parents like Claire Ness at Ecole, Emily Tremblay, and Whitehorse, that all just changed. I thought it was a good sign of the relaxing of these kind of strict rules. And it's also exciting to be able to send peanut butter to school because it's so much more affordable and it keeps so much better than things like lunch meat and cheese and whatever else you can put between two pieces of bread. Marie-Hélène Garnier is the principal of Ecole Emily Tremblay. Marie-Hélène, hello. Hi, Matt. How has the policy around nuts changed at your school? Well, um, we decided to allow nuts and peanuts um, in uh, in classrooms. That's how it's changed. <laughs> are there are there any restrictions at all in place? Yes, of course there are because uh, we have children quite young. Um, some of them start school when they're three, so classes in uh, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten still have the restrictions. Um, even um, but even with the restrictions, they still have to uh, be educated. I mean, they still have to be educated and and the staff as well. But yes, there are restrictions. But other than that, I mean, kids can eat. We can talk with the sandwich. People can bring the peanut butter sandwich to school. Yes. Why are you doing this? Why are you changing these rules now? Um, because um, uh, we believe in uh, in growing, and, um, and we believe that uh, change is uh, is hard and it's good. We also believe um, that um, it's um, it's important to listen to parents in our community, and uh, that's what we did. And uh, we want to be inclusive, not um, with. Um, I mean, when I say inclusive, I mean with. Um, dietary uh, restrictions, so allowing us to make it a lot easier for some families to pack lunch.